booth and the birds are just incredible so i think with that we'll turn it over and let you take it away yeah well thanks everybody for joining us today um yeah i'm gonna take the time this morning to kind of give you a hawk ridge 101 i tell you a little bit about uh, where we are and uh, what's we're seeing there lots um, and uh, kind of give you a little trip through the fall migration virtually, hopefully encouraging you to uh, get up there in person because there's nothing that replaces being there in person. So welcome to Hawk Ridge, one of the top migration locations in the U.S. Here's a view from our overlook. Um, if you're wanting to quiz yourself on the birds, that is a bald eagle flying at us, but we've got a phenomenal view from up there on the ridge line overlooking beautiful Lake Superior and also just a lovely wooded neighbor neighborhood down below us. So we've got quite the view going up there. Um, Duluth as a whole is an amazing place. That big lake does a lot for us. Um, we always have amazing birds. Um, St. Louis County is where Duluth is, and we always rank at the top of the eBird uh, County checklist in Minnesota for the most birds um, cited up there, the most different kinds. Right now, the current thing says 353 species of St. Louis uh, uh, birds have been seen in St. Louis County, more than almost 20 more than uh, Hennepin or Dakota. Or, um, any of the other high ones. So it's definitely an interesting place. We'll uh, give you a little slice. We say that Duluth is a 365 days a year um, place to see cool birds. And here's just a little uh, smattering of some amazing birds that we are likely to see through the course of the year. Um, so that's what I wanna do with this presentation is just kind of introduce you to the place um, how do you get to Hawk Ridge? Well, our fall migration site is on the um, east side of town. It's on your way out, not quite to the point where you're headed up the North Shore to Two Harbors and, and um, on up to Grand Marais. But you can see from the uh, diagram here, I kind of drew you in a little map on the bottom right here of coming up from London Road and whizzing back a little bit and coming out up on the ridge above. Hawk Ridge is um, 365 acres. Um, there's a key area, a core area in the middle that uh, is more than 100 acres. And then we've got the buffer zone surrounding it um, that is all um, managed and stewarded by Hawk Ridge um, Bird Observatory. Um, but it is actually owned by the city of Duluth. Um, so we have a trust agreement. Historically, Hawk Ridge has always been known as an incredible place to visit. Um, in the early days, birds were shot there for target practice. Um, duck hunters, uh, I'm told, would warm up on the raptors uh, before they went duck hunting. Um, 1937, members of the Duluth Bird Club gathered bushel baskets of dead hawks. Um, and back in that point in time, we didn't really have any protection for these upper um, echelon predators. And so they weren't protected. There wasn't anything that said it was illegal to do that. Um, but it all changed uh, or started to change for the better when UMD, the University of Minnesota Duluth, got its first ornithology professor. Dr. Jack Hofsland, um, he quickly um, honed in on what was going on at Hawk Ridge and the storyline goes that he would go out every day at the beginning of the day with cardboard signs that said, please don't shoot the birds. And every day they'd end up down the hill or back in the woods and every day he would go with more. Um, and there was a core group of people that were very interested in what he was doing and supporting that, that group became the Duluth Bird Club, which later became the Duluth Audubon Society. And they actually took a very creative way to solve the problem. They uh, tackled it by going to city council and getting the city council to make it illegal to shoot within city limits of Duluth. 
Um, and so that ended, thankfully, the shooting of Hawks. 1972, we were officially established as Hawk Ridge Nature Reserve. That's the actual property. And the research um, Hawk Watch and Raptor Banding and Education programs began. began. Um, Hawk Ridge became the first important bird area in Minnesota in 2004. And the uh, formal establishment of Hawk Ridge Bird Observatory um, as a separate agency from Duluth Audubon happened in 2004. We are in our 50th year of counting, banding, studying, and protecting, and educating about birds. Um, so it's been a pretty exciting week. We just had our 50th anniversary celebration last week. So things have been hopping. The mission of Hawk Ridge is always about the birds. Um, Many of these birds fly from long distances. We are trying to study all the birds that come through. We do concentrate a little heavier on the raptors, but um, studying the all of the birds that come through through um, research, education, and stewardship of the area is uh, is the mission of Hawk Ridge. Um, yeah, as far as migration, we are full bore in it, and this map kind of gives you an idea of where these birds are coming from. Um, the boreal forest in uh, northern Canada and parts that are in northern Minnesota as well um, produces anywhere from three to six billion birds every fall that have to migrate somewhere because most of them will not stay in the boreal forest. Um, we know that these birds like to stay in their familiar habitat as long as they possibly can as they're traveling through. And so that tends to make them follow what we call leading lines. And you can see um, in the diagram here on the left side, birds are coming potentially all the way from Alaska and Northern Northwest Territories of Canada coming through. They're staying in that, that familiar boreal habitat because it's easier to find food um, as they migrate we also get birds coming from the east, eastern boreal forest, same deal. They'll come this way and then they'll sort of meet at the top of Lake Superior um, and then they've got choices to make. When you hit the top of Lake Superior, that point is about 160 miles across. If you are a bird that is dependent on soaring um, and efficient flight, Flying over the water is not going to be efficient flight. There's nothing there to help them. No um, hot air pockets that doesn't develop over water. So they can't ride those up like an elevator. Um, so yeah, most of them will choose to um, scoot down the shoreline. Depending on what's happening with the winds, they may come to the, go to the east or if they go to the west, that'll funnel them right down through Hawk Ridge. Um, and like we say, Hawk Ridge is one of the top two or three sites in the United States for observing um, raptors under migration. And each year on average, we count somewhere between 60 and 75,000 raptors coming through during the fall season. Um, this flyway is the beginning. I always think of it as the beginning. It's not. It actually started in Canada, but okay, it's the U.S. version of the, <laughs> the Mississippi flyway. This flyway is used by 60 to 75 percent of the birds that migrate in North America, period. And you can kind of see that represented. Yeah, it's a birdie nerdy sort of thing to do, but did you know that you can look at weather radar and you see these little green dots on the map here in the lower right hand corner that's actually a lot of um, movement in the evening and this is this is likely songbirds um, or other noc nocturnal migrators moving and the local radar there's so much movement that local radar picks it up and makes these little round green circles this is the normal weather stuff down here that's much more distinguishable, but these little round circles, circles are indication of migration. And this map on the left is 11 years worth of spring migration, but you can see from the darkness here that is 
by far the busiest place and the busiest route for migration in the country. There's nowhere else in the country that has that amount of um, birds migrating through. So yeah, let's introduce you to a little bit about Hawk Ridge and the birds of Hawk Ridge. It's not unusual to on a fall day with a lot of birds coming through to see um, big wads of birds. Um, I was talking about thermals, that's hot air pockets. Birds that get together in the uh, hot air pocket are called kettles. And it's not unusual to have kettles that we are seeing from the Overlook area up there that are 400, 600, 800 birds. Oh my goodness, it's just amazing to see. So yeah, fall migration starts probably a little earlier if you than you think about it. Um, for a lot of the small birds, it may start as early as late July. Um, and the birds that come through on the earliest side of the spectrum are the birds that have got the farthest distances to go. Um, at Hawk Ridge, we start the official count for the season on August the 15th. We will count all the way through until the end of November, provided the weather permits. Sometimes snow gets a little over ambitious and uh, cuts our season a little short, as you can see from the picture on the, uh, on the uh, right hand side, snow is not unfamiliar by the time um, October is happening. These are our counters. We have given them the highest point there and they actually will divide up the sky and look for all of the birds that are coming through. We've done 50 years of standard count data and that has told us a lot. We've counted over th 3 million raptors and all of the numbers that we count are shared both with Humana, which stands for Hawk Migration Association in North America, and the Raptor Population Index. And it tells us lots of interesting things about Hawk Ridge as a site, but also its comparison to other Hawk Count sites and locations around the country. So there's a lot of stuff going on research-wise with the data that we're collecting. When is the best time to come? Well, if you got the itch and hopefully I'll, through the course of this uh, presentation, get you itching to get up there to see what's going on. When's the best time to come? Well, typically you wanna aim for days when the winds are coming from the west, the northwest or the north, because that's like flying with a tailwind and you can, the birds can really pick off the miles on those kinds of days. Other days, it's more like fighting a headwind and some of those good soaring birds are going to hole up and wait for a better day because their flight uh, depends on them making efficient use of the wind currents. Um, if they can't, then they will wait and go on a day when they can't. The largest numbers of birds, I always say, if you want to see lots and lots of birds come in September, because these are the birds that are coming through that have got to go the longest distance, they're going to get started a little bit earlier, but the big boys come on in in October. So we have the largest numbers in September, but the largest birds come in in October. Um, raptors generally peak migration for them is uh, between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m., but it can switch on either side of that and become longer or shorter according to how the weather's going and what the birds are actually doing. Um, September and October are the prime times to come, but you can come anytime, um, enjoy things. So come visit, we'll loan you binoculars if you don't have them, and we will let you get a look at all of these amazing birds coming by. I threw this slide in here yesterday. As of five o'clock yesterday, um, these are the top four birds counted this fall. Just take a take a wild guess. First of all, see if you can figure out who they all are, um, and then which ones do you think is in the top position number wise? When who's second, third, and fourth? Just a second there for you to do that. You ready? Ready to find some amazing answers? 
Well, in the number one position right now are the Blue Jays. We have counted more Blue Jays than anything else. I just left the overlook um, about a half an hour ago, and by the time I left, they'd already counted more than 700 Blue Jays today. So that's number one right now. Number two is Broadwing Hawks. Um, those are birds that we typically see in the raptor world, more of these birds than we do all of the others together. Um, and right now the, the total for the season for Broadwing Hawks is a little over 33,000, which is well above our average. Average year running, um, numbers are somewhere usually uh, 27, 28,000. So we are well above that this year, which is a good thing. Number three, cedar wax wings um, are way up there. And number four, sharp shin hawks. So if you wanna be a migration nerd, you can actually go into our website, hawkridge.org, and you can get up to the minute updates. And again, this is from five o'clock yesterday. So as of five o'clock yesterday, we had counted 56,568 blue jays, which is this green slice of the pie. Broadwings was 39,396. Cedar wax wings at 11,772. And sharp shin hawks at 8,308. 8, there we go, those Sharpies are ambitious. So yeah, and here's a little kind of overview that you could get on this page. If you go on our website, there'll be a, a link right smack in the middle of the page that says live update. And that takes you to a site that's called Dunkadoo, which is uh, named after a bird. It's a birding app that uh, the counters all over the country use. And uh, Dunkadoo is actually named after what American bitterns sound like when they're doing their call. Don't go do, don't go do. <laughs> so there you go. Bird nerd trends all over the place. Um, as of yesterday, yesterday they counted 46 species of birds and 4,683. Um, for the season so far, we've had 146 species and 150,479 birds. You can also go, um, if you want more specific information about raptors themselves, there's a link on our page that says Humana, H-M-A-N-A, -A, and that'll take you right straight to our spot on, on the Hawk Migration Association of North America um, count board. And this is a summation of what we've done so far for the whole season. We are at 51,778, or at least we were as of five o'clock yesterday. Um, so we are well on the way and we still got all of October and November to go. Um, so this is um, shaping up to be a nice um, uh, above average uh, migration year. But then again, you never know what's gonna happen with the weather in October. Migration typically starts um, in a big way in the summertime, late August is the time when common nighthawks come through. Here in Duluth, we count more common nighthawks than anywhere else in the world. Um, and it's amazing. They come through. Um, nighthawk is kind of a bit of a misnomer. They're neither active at night nor are they hawks. Um, so yeah, they sort of screwed up all together when they named those birds. These are birds that are related to birds like whippoorwills and common parakeet um, that are found at points further south. But that late oct or late November or sorry, late August time is the time that they're most likely to come through. Um, back in 2020, we had a date to August the 24th where we counted. 27,580 of these birds through in a single day. Um, sometimes what happens is the weather backs up and they wait for the winds to change. And that's what happened that year. There was just crummy weather during their pre-migration, primo migration slot. And 
they needed to wait. And when the weather changed, the floodgates opened. Um, so yeah, pretty amazing. We have a former um, Hawk Ridge counter, Steve Colby, who's a researcher studying these Northern Goss or um, common Nighthawks. So that's the beginning of the migration season for us. But I always say that a migration is a lot like a parade. You have the beginning of the parade, you got the middle of the parade, and you got the end of the parade. And this is a, a diagram that kind of sketches out who do we expect to see early and then September, who are we going to see more in the middle of the season, and then who are our late birds going to be. So let's let's just meet some of those birds, and I'll give you a few little tidbits about the research that we're doing. This is a um, osprey. Ospreys are one of the earlier birds to get going. Um, as the water cools, the fish go down, and osprey can only dive up to about three feet into the water, and that's as far as they can go without drowning themselves, so they're not going to do that. Um, once the fish head down, these guys need to boogie on down the road to where the water's not so cold. They will typically uh, winter on the Gulf Coast. Um, the next most likely bird early on are sharp-shinned hawks. These are the smallest member of uh, a family of hawks we call occipiters. These birds are not good soaring birds, but they are amazing maneuverers. They live up in the boreal forest and they are equipped for um, short flights and maneuverability. Shorter, rounder wings, long tails that they use for rudders to go through um, the woods, and they're actually hunting smaller birds. Here's one of our um, stalwart volunteers, Lula, who was about seven at the time. I just saw her the other week, and she's now 12 and considerably different. Her hair was purple the other day when I saw her. <laughs> so, but she's still definitely coming up to Hawk Ridge and volunteering. So, here's Lula holding the uh, sharp shin hawk, just to give you a size reference. Um, and some of you are probably wondering, okay, did, did she screw up? Um, why is there a wild turkey in this picture? Um, well, here's an interesting story for you. The more we learn about birds, the more we learn there is to learn. And um, one of our graduate students from UMD uh, a couple of years ago was working on a study to figure out what are these birds eating while they migrate. We have a pretty good um, knowledge base about what they're eating in their breeding territories and what they're eating in their wintering grounds, but nobody had really ever explored that en route thing. So she was studying that and what she was doing was taking um, cloacal swabs. Um, the cloaca for a bird is the outspout. Everything goes in the beak and comes out the cloaca. Um, and by taking a sample with a Q-tip of that, she's able to determine the DNA of some of the prey species. And would you believe in spring, these sharp shin hawks were found with wild turkey DNA. Okay, now there's something to imagine. This teeny tiny little top hawk taking out a wild turkey that big, hmm. That is a little bit of a stretch for the imagination. And so she was like, hey, this is crazy. Um, what, what could possibly be happening? So it's April, it's early spring in Minnesota. Um, maybe these sharp shin hawks are eating baby turkeys. Well, a little further research found out that turkeys don't hatch in uh, Minnesota until late May and early June, so it wasn't baby turkeys. Um, a bit more research found that, oh, that's turkey hunting season in um, Minnesota. So maybe these birds were finding maybe gut piles or um, birds that had been injured through the hunting process and not found by the hunter. Um, but nobody had ever seen sharp shin hawks um, acting like vultures and eating carrion. So it's changed our whole picture of these birds. Here's another um, earlier season migrator. These are northern goss, or, um, northern harriers. 
this is a male. Um, this black edge on the wing tells us that this is a female. I always see the white tail light to tell me that's a harrier. Um, Falcons are also birds that are built for speed and maneuverability and not very good soaring birds. Um, they will come through and it turns out that kestrels, American kestrels and merlins both track with the migration of another species, green darner dragonflies. These birds, actually, we can see them, and we see this regularly at the uh, overlook at the during the migration. If you're watching these birds coming through during the time that the dragonflies are also coming, you can actually physically see those birds reach out, grab themselves a dragonfly, and munch, 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 have a little lunch on the fly. Um, it's amazing. Now we're getting into the uh, soaring birds. Um, these north, um, sorry, I, my, my bird names are all coming out discombobulated today. But anyway, these are broadwing hawks. We can recognize them by the black edging on their wing and the striping on the tails. And these are the birds that we see in just numbers. Um, we only see lots of them. These are birds of the boreal forest. And interestingly enough, they tend to come through in about a two week window of time in the fall. We know that um, from our banding records and our count records over the years, that's when the birds are coming through in a big way. Well, further study on those tells us a little bit more about these birds. Um, they are flying many of them to at least as far as Central America or even South America. So they boogie through um, and they typically fly straight through and don't eat on the fly. The reason they don't is what's the primo uh, diet for a broad winged hawk? Well, it turns out they are reptiles and amphibian specialists. They love to eat those. Um, in the uh, boreal forest where they live. But trying to hunt for reptiles and amphibians on the fly is a tougher thing to do. So they typically um, stock up in their breeding grounds and fly straight through. Turkey vultures, we're seeing beginning to see some of these birds begin to move. We still have a local population that goes back and forth every day and people ask us all the time, how do you know you're not counting the same bird twice? Well, we only count the birds if they're definitely moving straight south and continuing on a straight path as they go by. These turkey vultures, some of them go back and forth all day until the point where they disappear heading south. About mid-September, we start banding owls. It becomes the part of the season where we have um, banding going on 24 hours a day. We band somewhere around 1,200 northern sawwet owls, teeny tiny little six inch high creatures. They win the prize for cute. Um, there's just no question about it. They're teeny tiny little things. We also banned a fair number of large eared owls as well as other species. Um, so the owl banding is happening at night, raptor banding during the daytime, um, and early in the morning, I'm out there um, banding songbirds and catching those guys as they're migrating through. So we see lots of interesting uh, uh, birds coming through the owls, we don't see them so much as catch them in the nets and can quantify the migration a little more differently since we can't see them physically flying through. Um, this bird on the uh, right here is a bird of some infamy at Hawk Ridge. This is a um, eastern screech owl and they are somewhat out of range um, up in Duluth. They are um, their range is their typical nesting area and where they live is further south than Duluth. But a few years back, one showed up around the banding station and started um, doing the screech owl calls and they thought, well, let's see if we can catch it. And by golly, they did. And we have since caught that bird 
every year for the last five years. It's clearly taken up residence. Um, we haven't gotten evidence that it has a mate and is having young yet, um, but we keep hoping. Um, so yeah, we just never know what's gonna happen and what's going to turn up um, from year to year. As we get later into the season and head into October, we get to what I call the changing of the tide. Um, I told you September's the volume numbers, but October is when the big birds come through. And we will have a day um, in the next uh, week and a half um, or so where the whole picture of migration will switch. This is a count board that we keep going every day so if you're up at the hawk ridge you can see up to the moment what's coming through and you'll notice that big numbers of turkey vultures coming through big numbers of sharpshin hawks typically if the broad wings are not in their big two-week window we're going to see more sharpshin hawks than a lot of other birds most days um, and this is october the first here's a day a week and a half or so later and Sharpshins have dropped way down and red tail hawks numbers have started to go way up. Um, it's it's a very it's like a light switch. One day the the sharpshin hawks are ruling the, the skies and the next day it's the red tail hawks and we will still see a few sharpshins coming through, but they'll come through in much smaller numbers. So the late season migrants include bald eagles, golden eagles, red tail hawks, and a lot of Arctic rough-legged hawks. These birds don't have to travel so far because um, most of them are gonna be what we call regional migrators, birds that are just going as far south as they need to. They don't really need to go at all, but they will go a little bit, I think, I think more than anything, because like humans, they like a change of territory, a change of shifting things around. This is the story of um, Jack, a golden eagle that we banned and put a satellite transmitter on um, back in 2012. That bird um, flew and bred way north of Great um, Bear Lake and Great Slave in Canada. Um, but one of the things they learned from this study of golden eagles, this was a cooperative effort with Minnesota Audubon at the time. And one of the big take home messages from this study was that we knew that birds were loyal to their breeding territories, but we didn't understand that they were just as loyal to their wintering habitats. Jack liked to spend the winter on the Missouri um, Arkansas border down there in the Ozarks. And we have evidence that Jack flew from the Ozarks all the way up to north of the, up there in the Northwest Territories in as little as 28 days, um, averaging about 88 miles per day um, by flight. That's pretty amazing. The uh, signal eventually was lost because um, we don't expect the batteries and these things to last terribly long. And unfortunately, um, Jack was found dead um, in 2020, 15 miles northeast of Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. So he was definitely on his way back to his breeding territory when he died um, and didn't make it that much further. So interesting things to learn from these birds um, through a wide variety of different ways. Um, red-tailed hawks, um, the, the myth amongst the red-tailed hawks is that the Eastern population doesn't have this dark morph. Well, I'm sorry, but the evidence is counter to that at Hawk Ridge. We see a fair number of these birds during the fall um, and are learning more about this process. Um, we had a grad student that just graduated with her master's that did a, a great study on these birds and determined that yes, indeed, these are an Eastern subspecies of red-tailed hawks and they do indeed have a dark morph. Um, so the, the world of hawk knowledge is changing as a result of some of this research. This is the Northern goshawk. This is also a late season. This is the largest 
member of the occipiter family. That bird that is a woodland bird that is a maneuverer rather than a soaring bird, we see and count and band more northern goshawks than most places. And um, it's sort of the signature bird for Hawk Ridge. We also see other things in the fall, plenty of sandhill cranes coming through, um, peregrines, falcons also, um, pelicans, we see lots of pelicans um, coming through both in the spring and the fall. And we do have a spring migration count that starts in March and goes through the end of May. So yeah, there's not a lot of the season. Well, we're, we're counting for a good half of the year migration. Um, there's plenty of environmental education happening at the uh, Overlook when we get birds back at the banding station. Um, we like to send them up, do a little demonstration with the bird, and then turn the bird loose um, and to continue on its journey. We see lots and lots, and we're in the season where we're doing lots of school programming and other programming with folks. Typically, we do more than 450 programs through the course of the fall with thousands of participants. Um, on average, 18,000 fall visitors come through, and that's on the conservative side. There's no possible way to count all of that, but we do the best we can to get an approximation. So there's lots happening up at Hawk Ridge um, through the course of the season. I thought I would uh, give you a final shot. This is from 2020. We had snow early that year. This is a beautiful rough-legged hawk, and I'm going to just turn it loose for you. Okay, one, two, Oops, we're going to get it twice. <laughs> Sorry. It was so beautiful the first time. I'm giving you a second shot. So, yeah, thanks for coming to the webinar today. Um, I did put some resources. You can get to the Hawk Ridge website. Uh, www.hawkridge.org and hone in on what's happening up to the moment with the count. Um, the Hawk Re Migration Association of North America website. BirdCast is a wonderful um, website that's done by Cornell um, Ornithology and you can actually go up and see what is likely to happen via migration um, in your area overnight and you can also get an up-to-date um, thing, an approximation of how many birds flew over your area every night. Pretty amazing. Um, and just general all about information, all about birds.org for Cornell also has lots of great information. So, yeah, time for questions. Yeah, it's awesome job. I know it's supposed to be a fantastic weekend out this weekend and the fall leaves are starting to change. So um, if anybody's interested, head on up to Hawk Ridge and Enjoy a, I'm sure you get, get some programming and stuff going on this weekend. Margie? Absolutely. Um, during this, the school week, we do a lot of school programming, but we always have public programs on the weekends. Um, lots of stuff going on. I was back at the owl banding station last night, having a, having a small group owl tour. So we've got those kinds of things as well. Um, it was amazing. There were a lot of birds flying last night. That's super cool. We have, um, we did put a link for Hawk Ridge in the chat. If anybody wants to go there and click on that, that'll bring you to their site. And I think you can get to the other links from there too, if you wanted to do that. And if you do have any questions, put them in the Q and A. I see we got a few of them popping in there now. So uh, the first one, Jeff was wondering how far could a sharp shinned or other hawks fly in one day? Well, and that varies a whole bunch. Um, and we learn all kinds of interesting things from banding. Um, when we band a bird, we get as much information as we can while we have the bird in our hand and then we turn it loose and we hope that someone will catch that bird 
um, again somewhere else um, soon. And as it turned out, we had banded a peregrine falcon that was released from Hawkridge and recaptured eight days later um, in um, South Padre, Texas. So yeah, just think wow. about that. <laughs> Flying eight days worth in on your own power. Um, sharp shins are also going to cover some um, some decent territory. Um, yeah, it's not unusual for these birds to fly 80, 100, 120 miles in a day. It's amazing. You last time I was talking to you, you were talking about how they can ride the thermals up, and for if I, I'm probably going to get this wrong, but for every mile in elevation they go up they can soar is it seven miles horizontally or? yeah those are the good soaring birds sharp shins can't do that sharp shins okay. are just not equipped to soar as well they'll soar with the other birds but it's really kind of comic you see them soaring in the kettle with the other birds and they'll flip their wings periodically like this is just too good to be true i can't really be soaring with the big boys um but they um, still can cover some significant territory. Those big soaring birds, theoretically, some of those guys, they can hit uh, that big wide spot in uh, in uh, of Lake Superior up there by Grand Marais, Grand Portage. And if the conditions are right, they can soar all the way through Duluth, barely having to flap their wings at all because the Sawtooth Mountains are set up just perfectly to set up thermals all the way down the, the North Shore. Pretty incredible. It's one of my favorite things to watch is when I was a kid growing up in the Mississippi Bluff country, southern Minnesota, to see the birds just soaring up and up and how high they can go and then they just disappear. But yeah, if you could pull your presentation down, that would be great. Yep. Thank you. There you go. Uh, Maverick had a question about how much practice does it take to recognize a hawk in flight? I know that's something that doesn't come overnight. <laughs> That's an ongoing skill, and all of the pros that count will tell you the same thing. You learn to learn how to be wrong, <laughs> but you do you do get much better. Um, you can recognize birds by um, shapes and behaviors a pretty fair distance away. Our counters are regularly doing that with birds that are a mile to two miles away, and they can recognize from behavior. Um, what that bird is likely to be, but they'll wait until it gets close to safe for sure. Sometimes that changes. Um, and yeah, even the best of the best will get busted by the birds. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I used to work with a falconer a little bit that would, he could always pick out the turkey vultures and the eagles and some of the different hawks from an incredible distance. So it just comes with practice and experience, I guess. Yep, yep, and I've got 12 years and I'm still working on it. Um, there's just there's just so many different things they can do um, that makes it a little tricky, but it is possible to get pretty good at it. Yeah. Uh, Maverick is also wondering, how do you catch owl in, in songbirds? Yeah, well, with most of these birds, um, with songbirds and owls both, and actually the raptors too, we use something called mist nets. Um, with the songbirds, we put those up in a spot where we think the birds are likely to fly through. They can't see it, and their little heads go through the mesh on the uh, on the net, and then they'll fall down in a little pocket, and then we un, un, untangle them. Check those nets every 20 minutes to half hour to uh, pull the birds and then take them to the banding station and, like I say, learn as much as we possibly can while we have them in the hand. Now. When you want to catch owls um, and raptors, that's a little different story. Raptors need a little bit of an enticement to come in. Um, so we use lures that look like injured birds. So it looks like free lunch is sitting right over there, um, but there's a net between them and free lunch. They, they just see the free lunch <laughs> and they fly in to the net and they get caught. With owls, we do something that's very counterintuitive. Um, with owls, because it's nighttime, the uh, the thing that lures the owls in is actually uh, playing their spring calls all night long. Now that makes no rational sense to us humans, 
Um, why in the world would you be thinking about breeding um, in the fall when it's getting colder? But works like a charm. And lots and lots of saw wet owls come through. Um, I didn't hear what they did last night, but the night before they had 52 um, saw wet owls and one barred owl they caught the night before. Well, it's interesting. Yeah. Uh, Kathy is interested in your netting and banding. Tell us more. Do you capture one bird at a time or in a larger group? You kind of just touched on that a little bit, but. Yeah, sometimes you get more than one at a time. Um, with uh, songbirds, it's frequent to have many of them coming through. The songbirds migrate at night, by the way. Um, they are trying to avoid those big boys that fly during the daytime that eat them. <laughs> so they fly at night. Um, and then when they settle down for the morning, there can be large mixed flocks of songbirds kind of settling down to fuel up for the day before they go on their next nocturnal adventure further south. So it can be possible to catch a lot of those birds at the same time. It's not unusual for, um, for us to set up um, three or four nets early in the morning and have 30, 40 birds in the first run of the nets. So as a bander, I have to think about those kinds of things. Think about who I've got for staff to help me out. Um, how many birds are gonna be in the area? Usually as you're walking into the station in the morning, you can kind of get an idea how many are lurking in the woods by the sounds that you hear. And yeah, I have also been known to watch weather radar um, in the middle of the night. <laughs> <laughs> wake up and check and see what the uh, what the motion is looking like tonight. So we plan very carefully. We don't want to be overloaded with birds. Um, want to get them processed and on their way again within an hour. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of complexity to this whole banding process. Um, and it takes a lot of training and a lot of skill to get to that point where you can identify. Yes, it's true. We identify confusing fall warblers all the time. <laughs> and it does take some practice to, to work, to learn, to differentiate, especially when they get into that dull blue or grab drab green, yellow color that they go in the fall. It's interesting. Uh, Jeff was wondering, and you touched on it a little bit, but can you explain how um, how you do the counts so that you minimize double counts or missed birds? Right. So um, I think you saw the slide early on of the count platform. They'll um, physically dis divide up the sky and make different counters responsible for different portions of the sky. They can help each other out and reinforce and double check. Um, Hey, hey, I'm seeing one coming. I think it's this. What do you think? And they'll they'll confirm and um, that sort of stuff as they're working on that. So when it gets really busy up there, and we've got those um, kettles of swirling birds. I mean, it can look like a, a swarm of angry bees um, off in the distance. The bald eagles are usually the first ones that you can pick out because they're nice and big. Then you put your binoculars up and you see what looks like a swarm of angry bees behind the uh, behind the bald eagles. And that's all those broad wing hawks and those kettles of four to six hundred birds. Um, yeah, what are you going to do as a counter with a swirling mass? That's pretty hard. But what they do <laughs> is it's for those birds, it's right like riding an elevator. So when you ride the elevator, you get to the top, what do you do? You get off and you start streaming to the south. And that's when they'll count them. Um, they're much easier to count. There'll be streams of birds, but the counter still regularly get into situations where they'll count by groups of tens or even hundreds. So they have little clickers to augment that and they know in their head, okay, I'm counting by tens right now. So click, 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 and then they can um, move that stuff to the electric, um, the electronic tablet stuff after they've gotten through that intensity. So yeah, there's some skill. There's a lot of skill, um, a lot of different kinds of skill sets that uh, we have yeah. to master at Hawkridge to do all of this stuff. It's amazing. Um, Judy had a good question on banding birds. I'm sure it's a pretty 
small percentage of the total bird population that you get to ban, but what percentage of the banded birds are never found again? Um, well, during migration, plenty. Um, we can have um, during the breeding season, and we do we do a breeding bird um, study called MAPS, which stands for Monitoring Avian Productivity and Survivorship. Um, we get really high rates of recaptures um, there, but even that is going to be sometimes somewhere in the neighborhood of 15, 25, 35 um, percent. When you get into migration banding, it's much, um, much less than that, typically maybe 5, 6 percent on a good year. But that tells us information that we can't get any other way. And there are a variety of different higher tech, more expensive ways to do this. Um, you, we, we mentioned uh, satellite tracking and doing some of those things. There's putting cell phone trackers on. They did that with snowy owls and still do um, with a research project called Project Snowstorm. And those snowy owls that are down from the Arctic, as long as they're in cell phone reception, their little transmitter will send a, send a report in every half hour. Um, but when they go back north, they get out of cell phone transmission zone. Um, but in the next winter, when they come back, there they are back in and receiving again. So. All kinds of interesting ways to study these birds, but like I say, some of them have a little, uh, little higher price tag, so we can't do that on every bird. <laughs> and you made a good point earlier too, and you said the the more we learn about the birds, the more we realize there's still a lot to learn, right? There's exactly something. So, Lorraine had a good question this year. Have you seen any effects from the avian flu on local migrants? Yeah, and we have been really happy to say that we have seen um, virtually, well, we've seen none in migration, um, thankfully. Um, we did have um, a couple of cases for wild birds in St. Louis County. The last recording of any wild bird cases in St. Louis County was in July. Um, so, yeah, those of us in the in the business here have been watching that really closely and really grateful that it doesn't seem to be um, hitting our birds in a big way, at least not right now. Um, the raptors are one of the species that uh, um, is potentially at risk. The waterfowl seem to be the main source for the, the majority of the avian flu and uh, those raptors are likely to pick up those dead birds, um, but right now it doesn't seem to be an active um, uh, process and hitting those birds. So we're knocking on wood and checking every bird that comes through and I haven't seen anything, nor have any of our raptor banders seen anything that had us alarmed. So thankfully. That's good news. Maverick, we're just about out of time, but Maverick had one more question here. Do you still get hawks out of migration season? So what hawks are kind of hanging out in the Duluth area? Oh, sure. Um, you know, I do a lot of programming up at Hawk Ridge during the summertime. And um, when we're doing the summer research banding, part of what we do is listen. Um, and there's always broad wings in the neighborhood. There's um, that sort of stuff. So we will, we'll see those, we'll see lots of eagles, we'll see lots of turkey vultures. Um, so yeah, there's still plenty. We don't um, actively ban the raptors in the summertime, at least not right now. Um, the songbirds is what we're doing the bulk of our work on in the summertime, but doesn't mean the raptors aren't there. They certainly are. Awesome. I, I got a note in the chat from Donna that says they were up there yesterday and they wanted to throw a compliment out to all the staff and volunteers. They did a fantastic job. She was impressed that there were so many people despite all the road construction issues around there. So I, I forget you guys do have a little road construction going on in Duluth once again. Oh, so. <laughs> yeah, tell me about it. But it is still possible to get there. Yeah. <laughs> Yep, I do a lot of going around, <laughs> but yeah, you can still get there. Thanks, Don. Much appreciated. And Jeff, comment has been very eye-opening and extremely informative presentation. Thank you very much. So awesome.
I think with that, we're just a couple minutes before one. We can, I don't see any other questions coming in. Craig, chime in if you see any that I missed in the chat. But uh, Margie, I'd like to thank you very much for sharing your expertise in this, something in Minnesota that we don't necessarily think of as a highlight. And it's a super cool opportunity to get up there and see some birds that we don't always have the chance to see every year and experience something different. So it's a great, great reason to drive north and, and pay you guys a visit. So, yeah, you can do that, but you can also look at migration in your own backyard. Um, there's yeah. plenty to see, um, lots of birds coming through. I, I keep hoping the cedar waxwings will come back to my crab apple tree out front, but they haven't for a few years now. So, well, they will, or maybe the bohemians will come visit this winter. We'll see. So, <laughs> it's always fun to keep an eye on them. So, well, thanks, see. folks, and come on up to Hawk Ridge, and we will uh, get you some birds on the wing. Thanks, everybody, and hopefully, we'll see you next week. We're talking about fishers, another animal in Minnesota that's kind of an elusive critter up in the forest. So we'll be talking all about uh, fishers next week. So hopefully we'll see you next week. I think Craig with that, we can stop the recording and we'll head back to the back room.